So welcome to everybody. It is Pentecost Sunday. And so we're so glad to have you here. What a unique way to uh, celebrate Pentecost Sunday, but via uh, the internet. And uh, if you remember, Pentecost was a time when uh, many would say it's the birth of the modern church, the modern Christian church. It happens to be a time, and if you go to the book of Acts, when you witness that the power of the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the people and upon the world in kind of an individualized basis, which is really uh, fitting well into what Pastor Larry is talking to us about today in the book of uh, Nehemiah, as the Hebrews would say it, or Nehemiah, as we would say it. And uh, Nehemiah has an interesting context to his name. Um, if you break it down in Hebrew from my study, it, um, it, it tells you exactly what it is. And it says Yahweh, which is their name for God, uh, comforts. And so um, it is a time when we can remember that Nehemiah, that we read about today, that Pastor Larry's lessons on, uh, also means that God comforts, that, that the holy God, Yahweh, uh, comforts us. And uh, what a better time to remember that during this time of the pandemic, as well as uh, Pentecost Sunday. So I appreciate you recognizing that. Now, today, um, if you remember last Sunday, uh, Pastor Larry has a two-sermon series. Today's the final part of that. Last Sunday when he started, it's the eight characteristics of leaders who rebuild, based kind of upon uh, one of the books of Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California. Um, and it's taken Nehemiah and breaking it down for us so we can understand how Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And if you remember last week when we read uh, from Nehemiah chapter one, we learned that Nehemiah was in the king's court and he was the cupbearer of the king. And I remind you that a cupbearer was an extremely trusted person and aid on the staff of the king because um, the, the cupbearer, in addition to picking the best for the king, also sampled it so that if it was poison, uh, the king would not get poisoned. So uh, the king trusted the cupbearer implicitly, um, trusted him, uh, the cupbearer, not only for the best, but also for safe. And I, I think it's a great lesson that Pastor Larry's taken us on, uh, particularly this Sunday as well. So last Sunday, the four C's, we're going to learn about the final four C's today. The four C's that, that he took us through last Sunday was compassion, contemplation, cheerfulness, and concentration. Compassion, contemplation, cheerfulness, and concentration. And today, it's going to be creativity, courage, clear conscience, and conviction. And uh, so when we get started, remember, as Stacy's reading to us, that um, God put on Nehemiah's heart to leave Babylon, where he was one of the key people in, in the structure um, of the king's court and uh, put on his heart that he was to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. So back in 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. And, uh, you know, uh, Zerubbabel was a Jewish person who eventually brought back about 50,000 Jews uh, about 40 years, 50 years after that, and they began to repopulate that area. But for a long period of time, nothing happened after that. And finally, Ezra, who came from Babylon, who had never been in Jerusalem in his lifetime, but Ezra was a scribe. Um, he was from the priesthood. So scribes were often, today we would call them probably lawyers um, in most cases. So he was a church lawyer, scribe, expert in the law, the Jewish law. And so he came back in about 558 uh, BC. Now remember, we're going, uh, when you're in BC, you're going to zero. So 558 BC. So then about 13 years later, uh, Nehemiah, God laid on Nehemiah's heart to come back. Ezra was working on fixing the temple. And Ezra, during that 15 years, was working on uh, getting the people to understand God again. And then Nehemiah comes back, God laid on his heart 
to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, archaeologists argue about how big Jerusalem was at this time. Um, the last time that the walls of Jerusalem were really rebuilt was uh, by one of the sultans during the Ottoman period, uh, which would have been in uh, AD, five or 600 AD. So about a thousand years after Nehemiah is there. And the walls that he rebuilt to show you how big that was, that took a task of three years. And it was basically walls that were uh, about eight feet to 13 feet thick and about 21 feet high. Um, and they were about 2.4 miles, if my history is, my memory is good. Uh, so about two and a half miles, if you will, long. And, and, but that was done a thousand years after Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. You're going to learn today, um, and, and I believe it's in our reading. I've been reading so much Nehemiah lately because of, of where I am in my personal study time, as well as Pastor Larry's focus. Uh, but it took them only 52 days to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We don't know how high they are. Um, we know that the Babylonians, when they tore the walls down, they basically tore them down in place and left the rubble strewn around. So these walls could be, if you can imagine, they could be blocks as big as a small car to um, stones big enough for maybe a, a 10 year old to pick up and throw. Okay, so uh, all kinds of rubble is sitting around. Wood would be mixed in with it, and dirt and, and dust. And, and so Nehemiah shows up in 445 and uh, God's put on his heart that he's coming to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to reinstall the wooden gates. And so when you hear the concept as you read Nehemiah about the gate post, that's significant because the gate posts have to tie into the walls and then they have hinges that they make that the gates swing on. And in almost every walled city in the world during this time period, and for many years after, at nighttime, they would shut the gates to the city and you couldn't get in until the next morning. And they did that so that the enemy couldn't sneak in, right? Uh, it was a way for them to secure their, uh, their families and their goods and, and their homes. So uh, that's a background for you. Um, Stacy, are you ready to read from the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew? <laughs> Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Before you read, you want to stand. We like to have a tradition here. If you've never been on our church uh, website here for Zoom, because we don't have a chance to be with each other, we always like to remind each other that we're we're two or more gathered. Jesus said, "There he would be also." So, even though we're we're looking at each other on the screen, this is still a holy place. Where you are is a holy place. Where I am is a holy place. And so if you would, let's stand as Stacy reads the Holy Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who live near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families, armed them with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked, while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand and supported their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeteer stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people. The work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding. 
Then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate you reading that for us today. You're so faithful, and uh, thanks for all your ministry that you're doing here. Now, um, we are at a, a neat part of the Bible here because, um, as Rick Warren has written and Pastor Larry has been working with us, we're, we're really starting to focus on uh, when you read these stories in the Bible, what does it do to change you? Uh, how does it influence you? What, what difference is it going to make in our lives, right? So we read history here. Uh, we read uh, great stories in the Bible. Sometimes it's poetry. Sometimes it's songs that we're writing and reading, rather. Um, sometimes it's uh, historical events. In some cases, it's symbolic language. But in this case, this actually occurred. So it's an historical documented uh, event in the, the history of the Jewish people. And so what do we do with that? And so Pastor Larry is challenging us to think about on Pentecost Sunday four key words that will help us to maybe um, think about how we uh, participate in our faith walk and how we work through our faith. And again, it's creativity, courage, clear conscience, and conviction. Okay? So let's look at the first one. If you were able to look at your outline, you can see it's creativity. And it's, um, I wanted to define that for you. Uh, Pastor Larry had a, a pretty lengthy uh, definition in his sermon this morning, uh, if you got a chance to, to hear that. Um, I, I condensed that a little bit by looking at a couple other uh, translations or definitions, and, and one that, that fit well for us today, I believe, is the ability to go beyond what you currently observing and experiencing, what you are, sorry, that word got out of place there, what you are currently observing and experiencing. So... Um, Think of creativity as being a situation where you're here and you're trying to understand your surroundings and how do you approach it in a different way. And so I, I think we have to think in terms of we're being creative now, aren't we? Um, who would have ever thought? I, I've told a number of people uh, in different circumstances that I've been in the past couple of weeks. If a year ago, I would have told you that um, we would – we wouldn't be able to travel about freely in the United States, that we wouldn't be able to go and see people. We wouldn't be able to visit, wouldn't be able to shake hands or hug each other anymore. If I told you that a year ago, you would have had me, um, you'd had me put in a, an insane asylum. You would have said, Doug, you're just, something's wrong with you. You're not thinking straight. And look where we are today. Um, we're in the middle of that, right? We're, we're in a time that um, nobody, in the history of America has ever been quite in this place. Uh, as we say in our business world, there is no playbook for this. We, we don't know what to do. Uh, there's no historical um, case studies like you read in, book, in business books to, to kind of put us on the right path here. So um, we have to be creative. And, and Pastor Larry reminds us that crisis can help creativity. Crisis can help creativity. And, and why is that? Why does crisis help our creativity? Anybody want to unmute and answer that? I liked what Pastor Larry said this morning, and, instead of, and he compared it to children and scientists when he said, instead of just saying, why, 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 just say, why not? Why not? And that, to me, stood out. That's good. That's good. Bill, you unmuted? Oh, I just, I was just gaining control of my life, Doug. Okay. <laughs> so crisis makes you want to gain control, Bill? <laughs> well, I'm not so sure crisis did that, but. <laughs> yeah, just in general? Yeah, in a, it's innate. Yeah, it's innate. So I want you to think about this. Um, remember a couple of Sundays ago, 
when when I was teaching, um, I, I told you about how the experts, uh, psychological uh, experts, will tell you that are, are are dealing with the neurological aspect of the human brain. That brain, the brain um, cr craves certainty. The brain craves certainty. In crisis, puts us into a spot in our brains where. Um, we're uncertain, we're unsure, that creates stress for us because again, the brain craves certainty. So crisis can help creativity because the brain is looking for a way to figure it out and to process it. And I would tell you that right now, creativity is important because it helps us to focus. It helps us to focus on things and helps to, to move us away from this period of, of confusion and uncertainty that, that we are living in right now. Um, Nehemiah created a pathway for success. So how do you think Nehemiah created a pathway for success um, as he was working through um, this thing that he was dealing with on a regular basis? Because remember, in Nehemiah's case, he was fighting um, everybody around him and he was fighting that nobody believed in what he was doing. So how did Nehemiah um, kind of work on this concept of creating a pathway for success? Anybody care to add that? Well, one of the things I hope you get out of this is, and, and uh, I can't help but see Bob Kurd sitting in the middle of one of the pictures there, um, as an engineer, he probably would say to us, you've got to break the problem down into smaller components in order to be able to begin to work on it. And so I think in our case, we all have to appreciate that Nehemiah, in order to be creative, he began to break it down, break down the task at hand into smaller components. And you may want to consider that in your personal life as well. Um, as you're struggling with uh, this crisis in your life, um, break down the things that you can control and then maybe set aside the things you can't control and recognize that that's okay. Um, you just heard Bill Warndolf and I going back and forth and we were joking about these things. And, you know, we, a lot of us like to be in control. When we're not, it creates stress. Bob, I think you want to say something? Yeah, I think... A crisis makes you think outside the box. You, yep. You look at problems differently in a crisis. Good. Uh, Sandra Heyman, I think you have your hand up. You want to say something? Uh oh, I, I don't think she's unmuted. Okay. Well, it indicates it indicates on Zoom that she raised her hand, but I don't see her. So, um, hear me? go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> I am in a crisis right now because I'm trying to figure out how to get my picture up on this Zoom thing and. That's why you see you doing goofy things. But I can hear everybody. And. <laughs> Good. Have to bear with me. No worries. Okay, so it, it becomes important that you think about in a crisis how you're going to um, kind of handle that. And, and, and Bob's right. Creativity. Uh, can help us through crisis because it can begin to allow us to at least gain some control of certain aspects of that crisis. So again, just some simple things to think about um, that some of you are already doing. You're reaching out to others. You are communicating. Um, it may be phone calls, text, emails, Facebook, uh, you know, whatever, whatever format it is. Um, you know, more letters are being written now than it have been in any other time in the past 10 and 20 years. So people are beginning to send cards and letters again. And then we're starting to go back to some old ways of doing things. Um, you know, think of this in, in a safe circumstance, again, safe circumstance, 
we can still get together in small groups and and you have to do it very carefully and you have to do it appropriately so maybe we're we're no longer thinking about large meetings but maybe we begin to think about how do we connect and even if it's driving by and and, and someone staying in their car and someone else standing away we can still visit it and um you know I, I know some folks who have older parents like i do and um you know they've told me that they'll go by and and their parents will open the door and they'll stand outside because they don't want to expose them to anything but they still get to see each other and talk and it, it may not be good as giving somebody a hug or or a handshake uh but but you're still connecting and so um Think of ways of being creative. Think of ways of being creative in your faith walk right now. Um, you know, uh, Stacy is 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 baking uh, baking herself to death, and and she's going out and delivering things to people uh, just as a way to to be connected and show love. Uh, again, some of you are are going and spending a lot of time making phone calls and and connecting with others. So uh, you're being creative, and and we're proud of you for that. We do just remind you, though, that being creative, you still have to be careful and, and you still have to be responsible there um, in that process. So Nehemiah began to break down this task into small groups, and he did something kind of interesting. He created alignment with everybody in Jerusalem because he began to make them responsible for those who lived in Jerusalem with the wall that was in front of them. OK, and often God calls us. We, we think that God wants to call us away to India and, and to Africa, and, and some people he does, it's obvious. But for most of us, God is saying to us, I want you to work at what's in front of you. Okay, what's in front of you? Uh, maybe it's where you work. Maybe it's with a certain family member. Maybe it's with a certain friend. And, and Nehemiah is teaching us a good lesson here, a pathway to success for most of us in our ministries. And, and making our lives better and other people's lives better is to look at what's in front of you and to deal with that. Don't, don't worry what's down there and don't worry what's over here. Think of what's in front of you. And Nehemiah convinced everybody, work at the wall in front of you. Okay, work at the wall in front of you. And if I'm busy working at what's in front of me and you're busy with working in front of you, you know what will we'll be like the, the Jews in Nehemiah's day? We'll rebuild the wall. Okay, we'll rebuild the wall. I'll build my section, you build your section, and, 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 and you build yours over here. And suddenly they'll all join together and we have a wall. It, it's really neat how Nehemiah did that. The, the second thing that um, the word that, that Pastor Larry and, and Rick Warren are sharing with us is, cur is, is uh, courage. And so creativity and courage. And so Nehemiah, I want you to show, I want you to see how he modeled that courage for us. First of all, he had courage to approach the king. If you go back in chapter one, um, you read how he prayed about it and then he had the courage to go to the king. The reason it took courage is the king had total authority over life in those days. And in the Medes and the Persians, before that, it was the Babylonians. Um, and, and the king, with just a wave of his hand, anybody could be put to death. He didn't have to justify it. He didn't have to give any reason. He didn't have to say anything. Just a wave of his hand. Um, if you remember uh, the, the story of, of Esther, um, when she went, and she was his wife, but when she, she was the queen, when she went to appear to him, um, he had to raise his scepter in order for her to come forward. Otherwise, if he didn't raise his scepter, she would have been put to death, the queen. Okay, so the king had total authority. And so Nehemiah had to have courage to approach the king. Now, he was approaching him with his, his, his drink, which probably was wine, and he was approaching him, and the king took it, but he had the courage when the king said, Nehemiah, why are you so downcast? You've never been sad in front of me. This can only be sadness of the heart if you're not feeling bad. And Nehemiah wasn't feeling bad. He just had sadness of the heart. And so he then had the courage to talk to the king. So look, think about Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is a reminder that, that God has brought into our lives the Holy Spirit. 
so that you and I have a part of God in us automatically based upon the fact that we believe in Jesus Christ. So you need to remember that you have the courage now through the power of the Holy Spirit to approach the King. We can approach the heavenly God, Father in, in heaven. We can approach him because we have the Holy Spirit in us. So our King, our God is approachable. And then we have to have the courage to talk to him. If you go to the book of Romans, and a couple of places in Romans are some really great scriptures, but basically it says that, that, this, that our spirit, the God spirit inside of us, communicates directly with God at the throne of God. Um, so even when you don't know how to articulate it, even when you don't know how to, the words to say, uh, maybe you're so upset and sad or hurt and depressed or lonely or worried or scared, uh, whatever it might be, whatever emotion or combination of emotions that you have, um, I want you to remember that God provides through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives the ability for us to communicate with God, even when we don't know what to say. Uh, in fact, the Bible describes it, our groanings, okay, our groaning. Oh, Lord, he's heard us. He understands us. He knows what's in our minds and our hearts. Even though it doesn't come out the right way, even though we don't know what to say, uh, God hears us. So you have the courage like Nehemiah to approach God, and you have the courage to talk about it and to how you feel. So Nehemiah showed us courage because he was willing to take a risk. And I want you to understand this. It does take courage to try to put it into words, how you feel feeling. Um, and, and you got to remember that, that all of us are feeling stress and pressure, right? Um, there is no new normal right now. We, we are all guessing what that's going to be. Um, I can't imagine what's going through the minds of, of some of our young people right now. You know, they're, they, they didn't have the opportunity to graduate from high school or college like everybody else. Um, the job market is, is pretty unsure right now. Um, they don't know if they're loved ones because, you know, we don't know who's getting this and what the, the circumstances or the, the results of, of contracting COVID-19 are going to be. You'll, you, I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, yeah, a friend of mine had it. He had a headache for four days and a, a scratchy throat for four days, and he's fine. And then you hear about somebody else that says, yeah, a friend of mine got it, and in three days they were dead. And and so imagine that we're processing, processing that. In a lot of ways, we have life's experiences with us, and we have we have life circumstances, we have confidence. Uh, we we kind of have that certainty, right? But imagine being 17 or 18 or 20 or 21, and you're, you're waiting to, quote, unquote, start your life, and, and now you're uncertain. So... Um, I want you to remember that our young people need people to encourage them on courage, okay? And, and you can be part of that. Maybe you have to be the one in their life to uh, offer them some, some encouragement, and encouragement, okay, to, to give them the courage to help them all. Um, now, I put on your outline faith. So what courage is required here? And obviously, we've already answered that in the way Nehemiah lived his life. But, but I want to ask you this question. How do we live that with courage? How do we live our faith out with courage right now? Anybody care to answer that? How do you think we can live our faith out right now with courage? Doug, can you hear me? I sure can. Go ahead. Is this Beverly? It is. It is. Okay. Um, to I just try to live each day as normal as I can, and I do it by faith. I try to respect everybody else's faith, but or their space. You know, if I am out in public, but I just have to continue on. God's in control, and I try not to let her let it hinder me, the situation, you know, I don't sit here and live in fear, why well, I can't do this and I can't do that. I have faith 
that regardless of what goes on, God is in control. So I just keep my faith and continue on to the best of my ability. Good for you. Anybody else want to add? Steve Gray, how about you? Yeah, Doug, I just think that all of us need to pray for our country right now. I think uh, it's bleeding. I, I think that uh, with we have over, what, 40 million people that are unemployed. Obviously, the people that are on this uh, Zoom meeting are not affected by that, but we become, I think, desensitized sometimes to the fact that, you know, what is going on out there? I think we have to be realistic. Uh, we also have to pray for those people that are uh, in the middle of these riots that are going on. And we live in a very, very, very trying time right now. So um, we need to pray for our country. Good for you. And, uh, and I think that's important. Doug, it's Julie. Yes, ma'am. I think Beverly, uh, one word in what Beverly said is fear. I think the way to live out our faith is to fight fear. Because uh, everywhere we turn, there's the news or this or that. People, uh, they're trying to instill fear in all of us. And we know that the Lord doesn't intend for us to live in fear. We need to be careful. Good. Amen. But we that, don't need to be fearful. That that's good. Uh, so so remember Hebrews eleven one is now faith is being sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. So I want you to appreciate that that it is important right now that even though we all have some uncertainty, and even though we all have some fear, um, we have to recognize who's in charge. Okay, and that's important. Now, Pastor Larry said something in his sermon that I think uh, a lot of profound things he said in the sermon, but one that really stuck with me, and I think it fits here on courage. He said this, two years from now, what do you wish I would have done during COVID-19? In, in other words, he's challenging us to think that two years from now, we look back and go, you know, during that time, I wish I would have. I wish I would have. I wish I would have. So think of that because that's going to take some courage too. And and, and maybe maybe for you, it's I, I wish I would have reached out to more people. I, I wish that I would have connected with more. I wish I would have gone and visited someone, even if I stood six feet or eight feet or 12 feet away. Um, and so I want you to think of that challenge that Pastor Larry gave us, right? I think it's a cool challenge. You don't want to look two years from now and look back and go, gosh, if only. I wish I would have. Why didn't I? And so maybe you ask those questions today. This thing is going to be old anyway. But at the same time, we don't want to look back because that's when we kind of say to ourselves, I failed or I, I didn't try hard enough or I wasn't honoring God or I wasn't faithful, right? All right, now let's go to the third. Uh, hey, Doug. Hey, Doug. Yeah. Yes. Could I, could I comment on that real quickly? Um, Please. What, so one of the things um, when we talk about, I think that's a great question that Larry asked uh, um, two years from now. So one of the things, you know, as, as uh, type A personalities, we're always so busy. And the one thing that um, we always wish for is more time. So you can do this or you can do that. And then here we are granted with COVID-19 more time because we're not scattered going everywhere that, you know, that, that life, you know, afforded us and all the other opportunities. And here we are. And so we're given time to maybe uh, have some, some of the focus time that we needed or to pick up a musical instrument or, or to be able to reach out to other people where we always said there wasn't enough time to, you know, it would be a shame to, um, I mean, that's a very great, good question, Larry. It has to be a shame to, to possibly live a life with some regrets when you're going a thousand miles an hour. And then when the world comes to a, a halt during COVID-19 and you can't go out and you can't do this and then live with any regrets at all to not be able to accomplish the things you couldn't do when you, you were scattered so busy. So 
Um, I appreciate Larry asking asking that question and, and forcing us to think that way. So thank you. It is good, absolutely. Okay, so the third concept is clear conscience, clear conscience. And I want to read to you, uh, well, I won't read it as much as just tell you about it. In, in chapter five of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was considered a governor at this point, King Artaxerxes from the uh, uh, Persian Mede, Mede Persian um, uh, Empire that had sent him here. Um, as he was appointed as governor, he was allowed to live a certain way, be uh, taken care of a certain way, and he chose not to do that. He, he chose to be among the people. He chose to um, not live um, high on the hall, maybe you might say, right? And so he wanted to make sure that he knew that he was doing God's work and not hiding behind the royalty that he had been placed in. And so there's a couple of key things here I want you to think about that help us to, to keep or to, to adopt or develop a clear conscience. Okay, I wrote them down for you. There's plenty of others, but these are the ones I want to focus on. Regrets. Uh, Pentecost Sunday teaches us that God's spirit came to dwell in us and with us, right? If that's the case, I want you to understand that, that one of the things that God's Holy Spirit does is helps us to push out regrets and instead to look at change. Because God's desire is to change us to be more like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit in us gives us that power, empowerment, the power of the Holy Spirit that we always talk about. And so if you have regrets, turn them over to God and let them go. One of Satan's great tricks, one of, as I like to say, one of the lies of the pit of hell is that, that we have a regret and we keep remembering it and bringing it up and reliving it and, and remembering it and bringing it up and reliving it. We keep that cycle, okay? So get rid of your regrets and remember that once you have dealt with them with God, God has forgotten them. In fact, the Bible describes it as far as the east is from the west. Okay, that's infinity, right? As far as the east is from the west. And so remember, your regrets can be given up. Another thing to help with your clear conscience is failures. Um, now, you may put failures and regrets together. I would absolutely argue they aren't the same. I, I would absolutely argue that they're absolutely the same. One may have created the other, but they are absolutely different. They're not the same. And so um, if you're going to dwell on your failures, it's going to screw up your consciousness. Okay? It's going to interfere with the way the Holy Spirit works in your life. So um, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't learn from your failures. I, I'm strongly convinced that we need to learn from our failures. But don't let failures define you. Don't let failures define you. Uh, the third key word, and Pastor Larry mentioned this yesterday, was integrity. Um, and integrity is the ability to be truthful with yourself. Uh, that's one definition, the ability to be truthful with yourself. Integrity is that, that you are going to be a man or woman of God, no matter what the circumstances are, and that you're going to live your life for him. That's our faith definition of integrity, okay? So I encourage you to think about if you work on your regrets, your failures, and your integrity, and you hand them over to the Lord, and you practice those well, particularly the integrity aspect, um, it will help you with a clear conscience, and you won't be focused on those things. And then finally, a clear conscience gives us a pathway where God wants us to be. Um, we have to appreciate, above all else, that God has a plan for us. Um, you know, I've shared with you Jeremiah 29, 11, which is one of my life's verses, uh, you know, for I, have, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so God does have plans for a future for us, for a future of hope. And, um, and I'll, I want you to think about that. So clear conscience is important. The, the fourth concept or fourth word that Pastor Larry shared with us, the last one of this two-sermon two, uh, two sermon series, is conviction. So we have creativity, courage, clear conscience, and conviction. And if you read the entire book of Nehemiah, you're going to find that eight different times Nehemiah's enemies tried to distract him, trap him, uh, harm him, uh, turn the crowd against him, whatever it may be. And even his own people 
got in his way. Even some of the workers, after they started the work, they lost hope. Um, their hearts melted, some translations say in here. And so what that's meaning is, is they gave up. And, and I, but I want you to appreciate that he never did. In fact, in chapter 6, verse 9, here's, here's what he said. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I pray, listen to what Nehemiah prayed, how simple this is, but powerful. Okay, listen to this. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Nehemiah didn't say, Lord, take it all away. He didn't say, Lord, hide me from this, protect me from this, shield me from this, build a force field around me with this, Lord. He said, now, Lord, strengthen my hands. God intends to strengthen our hands during this crisis and during this time when he isn't going to take away COVID-19. It doesn't appear. That's not part of his purpose or plan, perhaps, in this case. But he can strengthen our hands. He can give us the strength necessary to face the task in front of us. And that's God's, that's God's plan. So uh, Pastor Larry also said this, and I really liked it yesterday. He said, an opinion is something you'd argue about. A conviction is something you'd die for. Let me read that again. An opinion is something you'd argue about. A conviction is something you die for. And we see that. Um, you know, it's really easy for Doug Rinker to talk about COVID-19 and, and talk about, well, it, you know, it really hasn't been such an impact on my life. I mean, it certainly changed things around. I haven't ha had the experience of all these other people. But think about all the EMT and the firefighters and the policemen and the medical workers and the nurses and the doctors and, and, and all those people who are on the front lines like a battlefield. Um, Amy Orndolph was, was speaking to us recently, and that's the way she described it, that, that the medical professionals are on the front line of the battlefield. Okay? That's conviction. That's conviction. That's not an opinion. That, that's conviction. So we can argue about COVID-19 and the governor's wrong and, and the president should have handled it differently. And, and, and why can't uh, Dr. Fucci and, and, and Dr. Bricks and those, why can't they get this right? We can argue all day long about that, right? But think about the people who go to work every day, putting their lives on the lines for us. Okay, that's conviction. So I believe God wants us to go from an opinion to conviction. And, and I'm not sure what your conviction is. Um, Doug Rinker struggles with what his conviction is sometimes. But God will lay on your heart if you seek it, what he wants to convict you of. And I'm not talking about just sin, but maybe a direction. Um, pray for conviction from the Holy Spirit to convict us when we've done wrong. Because at Pentecost, God's Spirit came to live with people, inside people, to be, be in us, but to empower us. And if God's Spirit is to empower us, and that means... We have to say, convict me of what I've done wrong. And another way to look at that is, convict me of what I need to do, what I need to change, and what I need to do. Lord, convict us. Joshua also talked about conviction um, in Joshua 24, um, in verses 14 and 15. And the, 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 the Israelites are about to go into the, the new promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, okay? And, Moses has been gone, and, and they've defeated a lot of their enemies, and, and Joshua's at the end of his time. He's about 110 years old, just about to die, and, and uh, Joshua says this, uh, now fear the Lord and serve him with all your faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves to this day whom you will serve whether the God your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. In other words, he's saying, you can serve everything around you. But look what he says. This is one of my life's verses too. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's conviction, folks. That's conviction. So, I want you to know that a conviction is what you must act on. So think of this and dwell on this. What convicts you? 
And then along with that, a great question is, what holds you back from acting on it? What holds you back? What grabs you and pulls you back so that you don't move forward in what you're convicted for? Because sometimes, folks, in order to move forward with what's convicted you, you have to have creativity, you have to have courage, and you have to have a clear conscience before you can act on what's convicting you. So Pastor Larry has challenged as well. He's challenged as well. If there's ever a time when we need to have all those things that he's been sharing with us, compassion, contemplation, cheerfulness, and concentration, and then on the kind of the, the backside of those is that creativity and the courage and the clear consciousness or clear conscious and, and conviction. Now's the time, folks. Now's the time. God's spirit dwells in us, lives in us, so that we can be people of God, so that we can change the world. And change the world we've got to. I'd say the end of that. Now, let me give you a, a PSA for just a more public service announcement. Um, it appears right now that we are going to have um, – uh, a church drive-in service on June the 21st. That's three Sundays away. Um, and the way it's going to work is uh, you'll actually, uh, you have to kind of register. That's what uh, the, the, the officials would like for us to do. So there'll be a pathway to do that either by calling in or emailing in. Um, and if for some reason you, you forgot to do that, you can still connect and we're still welcome. Um, you're going to drive into the church. You're not going to get out of your vehicle. And uh, we'll actually have a worship service. And it will uh, more than likely be through a Zoom phone call like this. In fact, um, we hope to have those services every third Sunday from here on out. Drive-in services until we're allowed to get back together. Don't know how long that's going to be. But in the interim while we're doing this, um, so we'll have this Zoom 10 o'clock Sunday hour um, every Sunday. And on the 21st of June, and thereafter every third Sunday, we'll be, instead of Zooming together like this, we'll be Zooming here at church. So if someone can't make it, they'll still be able to listen in or maybe even be able to watch in through Zoom. And then on the 21st, what we're going to be doing, um, Amy Orndolph uh, made some suggestions and Pastor Larry did some research and, and, and they ended up coming with a great idea. So we're going to serve communion that day, and um, it's going to really be kind of cool. It looks like a little half and half cup, and uh, we'll each be given one individually. And as you pop the top open, there's a wafer in there, and Pastor Larry will have consecrated uh, those in advance. And then you pop up another little tab, and it will be the juice inside of it. So we'll all be able to, in the presence of each other, maybe not physically side by side, but in our vehicles, we'll be able to celebrate communion together. Won't that be a great time for us? And so uh, we're looking forward to June the 21st. It'll be at 10 o'clock. We're going to try to keep, right now in this unusual time, we're going to try to keep everything kind of standardized. So, so think in terms of Zoom 10 o'clock. Now, every other Sunday, we'll still be doing the live stream. So you can go online and watch just as you do through our website, and you can see the worship service. Uh, Pastor Larry and Barbara Gray and, and, and Chris and, and Whitney Gray are doing a wonderful job of putting all that together for us, and we really appreciate them. And so think in terms of um, we can still participate in that together, but on the, on the third Sunday, starting June 21st, we'll be able to come together in our vehicles. Uh, we're not supposed to get out of our vehicles for safety reasons, but we'll all be able to see each other anyway and wave and and, uh, and we'll be able to listen to the service via Zoom, so perhaps through your smartphone, um, and uh, we'll be able to, to participate in community together. So it'll be a great time together. So uh, more details to follow. Pay attention to your email. And if you know anybody that doesn't have email, please pass on to them. Um, of course, family can ride together. Um, uh, Barb, I don't know if you've adopted uh, Steve Ginn completely, but perhaps he can ride with you if he's part of your family now. Um, uh, knowing Steve as well as I do, I'd check his background before you adopt him, okay? All right, so let's end the word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you that it's Pentecost Sunday, Lord, and, and we don't have to be together for the Holy Spirit to be around us. We don't have to be together because the Holy Spirit's in us. We are together, Lord. 
our spirits are connected. The, the almost 30 people in this phone call, we are connected. Lord, thanks be to you that, that we are connected. It may not feel that way, but we are. Our spirits are joined together in praising you, Lord, and saying thank you for the gift of Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the words that Pastor Larry has shared with us and, and for some of the writings of Rick Warren that, that generated these eight C's that help us toward uh, living our life to the completeness. And thank you for the challenge that Pastor Larry has given us. What will we say in two years as to what we wish we would have done now and help us to be the kind of people that have the creativity and the courage and the clear conscience and the conviction so that we would do those things now, not later. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your powerful name we pray all these things. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Blessings to you. See you soon.